I found that nothing in life is worthwhile unless you take risks. Nothing. Nelson Mandela said, there is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that's less than the one you're capable of living. No. So do what you feel passionate about. Take chances. Don't be afraid to think outside the box. Don't be afraid to fail big, to dream big. But remember, dreams without goals are just dreams. My name is Joe Hosmer. I was the founder of Mountain Limited. I am the founder of Mountain Limited in 1979. It was founded as Joseph H. Hosmer doing business as Mountain Limited. Uh, and we were registered in Portland, Maine. And we evolved into the um, becoming a corporation thereafter. I was born into the telephone industry. Uh, my father had a construction company that did utility work and we had two small independent telephone companies off the coast of Maine. Together I don't think they had 600 subscribers. It was a very small telephone company but had hundreds of miles of, of line and cable, very rural and, and spread out. I was a combination man at that stage. Um, I come from a construction background over school vacations, went to work after after school as a combination man, which meant I did everything. Jack of all trades is kind of the uh, nomenclature for it. Uh, central office, maintenance, uh, lineman job, uh, routine engineering, installation and repair, delivering telephone books, everything. Uh, the telephone company grew a little bit and the opportunity for my father to sell the telephone company and retire um, came about and he sold to Continental Telephone Company or Contel in those days. That was a kind of a, a real landmark for me. I stayed with the telephone company and went to work for Contel. Having always been involved with a family business, this was the first time I was involved with a large corporation. Stayed with them uh, in Maine, moved into their engineering headquarters, was in charge of all of the toll and extended area service, the EAS um, facilities in the Northeast United States for them. I was then sent to Washington DC to work, did not care for that, left Contel and went to work on a um, for a company that did primarily line construction, <clears throat> pardon me. And that was, that was where I started um, after Contel within that company. And then I eventually became the president of that company. We went to Panama to do a project, to bid a project, which I enjoyed estimating and bidding quite a bit. And especially if you throw me into the jungle, that's a, that was a, a good time for me and came back, we had won the job, um, but we were never able to, to fulfill it because the government changed in Panama. Noriega took over and canceled all existing contracts. At that point, the company that I was working with did the variety of things, but I decided that I was going to move on after having a taste of adventure in the, in the jungles of Panama and the company that I was with at the time wanted to remain or actually contract to become a um, regional company. And simultaneously, I would subsidize my, my income by doing one, a couple of my passions, which would be photography and also doing mountaineering, mountain climbing and teaching technical rock climbing in North Conway, New Hampshire. Because of the nature of the beast of what I was doing, I went down and started Mountain Limited. And that was a, a company which I used to offset my expenses um, or to capitalize on my expenses for what I was doing outside of the telephone world. I eventually got a call to go to Liberia. 
West Africa. Went into to Liberia and started working there to do a feasibility study as to what the, the government needed for phone lines, phone system. I was hired by Clifford of Vermont, which is now Power and Tell. Worked with, with them over there, identifying what cables were needed. On one hand, Clifford could look it up in a book and order it, and the government could say what they needed or what they wanted for a good service, but nobody knew the nomenclatures and, and how to identify what type cable, what size cable. And so that was where I came in as kind of a technical interpreter. Went through the whole process at the end of the at the of my stay there doing the estimate for the country. Came back and we met with the president of the country. And, and at that time he said, We like your proposal, everything looks good. We want to use Clifford of Vermont to provide the cable. However, we don't want you to just give us cable and walk away. We want you to train us on how to install it and maintain it. So we adjourned for a while and came back. Uh, and Clifford of Vermont said, okay, we will take and provide you all your cable, but we don't provide engineering and training and so forth. But Mr. Hosmer's company will do that. Well, Mr. Hosmer's company consisted of Mr. Hosmer. And, and that was about it. So we shook hands and I, and I figured, yeah, I can put together some people to train the, the, the folks of Liberia how to install their phone system. And the, the president asked me for my business card. Well, I didn't have a business card. And so I fumbled around and I pulled out a business card, which I had for Mountain Limited. And it was mountaineering and um, photographic and mountaineering services and I gave that to him he wanted to know what that was and I said well it's just another division of Mount Limited so I, I flew home and the first thing I told Sandy when I got there is we've got to have new business cards made up that show Mount Limited telecommunications consulting and, and contract and we went ahead and, and did that and that's how the name Mount Limited got kind of transferred into my telecommunications life um, by lack of having a uh, no other business cards available. Put together a team, we did our work in West Africa. From there we had our friend Judge Green in 1982, I think, yep. 1982, broke up AT&T. And when they broke up AT&T, all of a sudden it was open to the, to the free market. We went into Sprint, and, and got some work as subcontractors for Sprint, running, doing all the, the layout of a fiber line up the, between Chicago and Milwaukee, Illinois. We did a little bit of work down in Georgia for MCI. Then I went to AT&T and I said, look, we, we want to do some work for you guys. And well, who the heck are you? I said, well, we've been working for foreign governments. We just, now that things are opened up in the United States, we're going, we've are going. we done a little bit for the your competitors. Well, geez, if you're working for Sprint and MCI, we want you to, to work for us. So we got into AT&T, which I'd never been able to get into. Another year or two goes by and we ended up finally working for what was then New England Telephone, New England Telephone Company and got some work there and then we went to work finally and did some some projects in and around portland which was our headquarters at the time so i think we worked something like six or seven years as a as a business doing telecom work before we ever did the first thing local so we did it completely backwards. We started off as an international firm, then we became a national firm, and then we did regional work, and then eventually we were able to do some local work. So that was a that was kind of the, the launching of, of Mount Limited into large numbers of inspectors and outside plan engineers, which is what our focus was. Most of our work was, was well outside of the state of Maine. The, the vast majority of it was. 
it was a, a matter of, of going to where the work was. And that was the thing that scared me away from the firm that I had left previously is that they were contracting to become a regional firm, which I saw too many companies take advantage of kind of a, an upswing in the economy or the, the housing or something and, and be busy as heck. And then all of a sudden not, not have anywhere to go when things slowed down. And so if, if there was a lot of work in California, we would go there and we would, um, we would grow organically from within ourselves. And we also would grow by virtue of, of acquisition. We decided that we wanted to work on the West Coast more. We could go, we could rent, we could hang out our shingle, we could knock on doors, but it was cheaper and faster for us to be able to go and acquire a company that was already established in on the West Coast, which is which is what we did. We went and acquired um, B and M Communication Services in Sac the Sacramento area, and their biggest client was. Um, again, in those days, Pac Bell, Pacific Bell, Pacific Telephone, which was the Bell operating company working primarily San Francisco. We did a lot of work in the San Francisco area. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you some, some trivia. Your 800 numbers, um, 800 322 8627. The 8627 is VMCS, VM Communication Services, which is one of the ways that we were promoting ourselves on the west coast with the 800 number with the with the vmcs at the end but I, I guess i'd have to say i was fortunate enough because when when i started work for the telephone company the independent telephone company and doing construction back in back in my day you know we're climbing poles um there were oh what we called open wires it would be the the open wire is pre-cable uh, where you'd have iron wire that would be run on insulators and, and go through. Um, I'd be dealing with that. We had um, just turned over into um, when we bought Appleton Telephone Company, they were Magneto. And that was part of the job was to, you know, this is the old crank, you know, dial or crank three times for Martha down the road. Um, so that was the, the very beginning um, technology. And in 1955, um, the telephone company that, that my father owned uh, was a dial phone, you know, had a rotary dial. And it was the first independent telephone company in Maine to have dial service in, in 55. And we had cable, but it wasn't color coded. It was red and white cable. It wasn't blue, orange, green, brown, sleep. It was uh, the old style cable that was just miserable to work with, lead cable to work with. So we were, uh, I was uh, in a situation where I could go right on up through the, the ranks and, and watch the telephone industry just blossom. You know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, we started, as I said, heavily um, in the 70s. Yeah, in the in the 70s, starting off with late 70s with some fiber optic, and then when they broke up AT and T, you know, we went into it into it crazy. We did India uh, when when I was around. We were doing overseas work more, um, but we did all up and down India. We did a bunch in Italy. We've done um, in Canada, the, helped with the ring around New Brunswick, uh, and anywhere that you can imagine. We, we've been in design fiber optic. And, so we, and then it evolved into the, into the cloud um, and, and the communications with, and it, we started pre-internet. You know, we we were we were knocking on doors and, and and working people before people even had websites. And then we were one of the first to have a website. And we were one of the first to use um, internet communications for for all of our employees and so forth. So it it's evolved quickly. Um, we had I say we Sandy and I 
looked at each other. Boy, I would have to say it would be in the early 2000s when there were more cell phones than there were landlines. And we figured, I figured that, okay, now's the time for, for the two of us to kind of phase out that the, the landline business is going to be lesser and lesser and lesser and the cellular, um, the cellular and the wireless industry is going to be more and more and more. And we got into it and we, we did some of it, but we never enjoyed the success that we did with the landlines. And, and that, in my mind, was easier for us to make that step for us to retire and for Mount Limited to go on to bigger and better things with, with new leadership and with, with new ownership. Um, our motto, our tagline was equal to the best is not good enough. And that evolved from a conversation that we had had with a client that had a competitor that was was a very good competitor and they had a ton of people working and he told us that you know you guys are just as good as your competitor um, in fact you're as good as anybody else. and sandy grabbed a hold of that and, and took it with her marketing background into equal to the best is not good enough which is was our motto for years and years and years uh, we wanted to have we wanted to have really good talented people there. We weren't uh, in the early days. There was Mount Limited and there was body shops, and the body shops would just crank them through as fast as they could, and they might last two months on a four month assignment, and then they get run off. They bring somebody else in. We didn't want that. We didn't want that reputation. We wanted people that were just really stellar. Um, and so that took a lot of time and training to, to get to that level. We always had a, a saying, or I did, whenever anybody was hired, that we wanted them to A, make money, and B, have fun. And if they weren't making money, they could expect me to come around and, and probably let them go. And if they were grumping and griping about this and that, and it obviously was not, wasn't fun for them to be there, we'd let them go too, even if they were a big producer. It was a matter of make money, have fun, keep the environment up, keep the, the people up, keep the quality up, um, and do whatever it takes. Even though we might lose a battle here and there, we've got to win the war by keeping the customer happy and their reputation intact. A, a or a way of life for the right person it, it's not a place where you would land do your thing for a few months and go on to, to something else it's not a pit stop um, it for the for the best for the very best uh, mountain will become um, a part of you and you will take that um, with you forever and ever not to lose its spirit and its foundation. Um, Sandy and I worked hard on the, the foundation of, of Mountain. Uh, and, and I can see that it, that it continues on, it, at least through April and, and some of the other folks that are still there from days gone by, that that, that foundation needs to stay. And, and that's what I hope the future of Mountain is, is to carry that forward. One of, the, one of the stories that, that I tell that was, that's always kind of a funny story was I was looking at um, building a phone system in the Darien jungle, which is the end of, of Central America, the south, southern part of Panama. And we would, were dropped off by a, a single engine plane on a grass strip and we literally were whacking the, our way through with machetes through the through the bush to a river. We got to the river. People saw the plane so that they knew that there was visitors coming into the town. The town was Yaviza. And we were put into dugout canoes and paddled up the, the river to the little village. 
And the prime source of meat that we had to eat for the week or so that we were there was the chicken that had lost in the cockfights the night before. And it was, it was pretty trying to, to eat these, these old chickens, these old tough chickens that were cooked up with a bunch of rice. Um, every night. So I asked one of the locals, I said, is there any other source of meat around here, you know, that we can, can get? And he took his gun, he said, come with me and we'll go get an iguana. And I said, an iguana? And that's a big lizard thing. He said, oh yeah, yeah, that's good. So we went, we, he got the iguana and we took it back and we started to cook it. And I said, what's this thing taste like? It doesn't look too appetizing he said oh it's good it's good i said no really what's it what's it taste like he says well it tastes like chicken but the more you chew it the more it tastes like iguana so it was not a good different source of meat we went right back to the to the chickens the the next day the we had enough iguana one night to last us a lifetime so that was one of the stories i i relished that we had carried along with us In 2014, I crossed the Himalaya mountains on a motorcycle. Triumph motorcycles had been prevalent in India back in the day when India was a colony of England. And it was, it's my belief that they wanted to get reestablished there. And so one of the ways to do that was to show that their, um, product that their motorcycle was capable of handling the, the absolute worst that India had to offer. Uh, not only the traffic in New Delhi, but to be able to, to literally cross the, the Himalayas. And they had 12 people, myself included, they provided 12 motorcycles, 13 motorcycles, one was a spare. And, um, we started off and, and we went up into the Pakistan, I think it was Pakistan border. And then we went over to the Chinese border and we crossed all the, the, over the, the Himalaya mountains. And it was about a, a little over a two week trip um, and, and back. So that's, that's probably one of my, one of my bigger adventures and, and one of um, that not everybody knows about. And, and, and adventure is, is probably my, my passion um, to not necessarily read about it or to watch it on TV, which I do both, but to actually go out and, and experience um, adventures and challenges and um, kind of need to, to see things or to do things or to accomplish things that, um, that few people have.